Thank you for being here today. Thank you for joining me in, um, yeah, just having a conversation about what it's like to live life with someone with a disability, or at least something that has been, maybe you could say, um, stamped as a disability by society. Um, yeah. Because even that, I think, is something that we should be willing to reconsider. Like people have different ways of viewing that for themselves and for their families. That's where it comes in to just listen and sit and hear your story and hear how you and your family deal with the situation that you find yourself in. Maybe yes. you can start with introducing your family. Yes. Okay. So my name is Haley Braun. I grew up in Port Elizabeth, South Africa. And so even that I know that might not sound very different or for someone with disabilities, but it is. Um, a lot of times people with disabilities, they're not in full inclusion classrooms. It, the view of them is very segregated and separated from the rest of society. So we are a family of five now. We live in the United States of America in Northern California. Obviously, it's me and my husband. He's American and I'm South African. And then we have three children. Our oldest is Aiden. He's nearly six. He'll be six next week. And then our middle child, Liberty, who has Down syndrome, mm -hmm. she's three and a half. And then we just had a baby seven months ago and his name's Ash. So that's our family. I'm in the ministry. My husband is in film and media. Okay. And we believe in Jesus and we're Christians. So Liberty, your daughter, three and a half years old, how would you describe her character? Knowing her for three and a half years. You know, it's so interesting. I think a lot of people have a, like, in, the, in a lot of kindness, they'll say things like, oh, people with Down syndrome are so loving. They're the kindest people. They're so affectionate. And I'm like, wow, Libby is very loving, but Libby is feisty and she is fiery <laughs> and nobody ever uses that. And I actually think a lot of parents who have kids with disabilities, they will tell you that there's usually quite a fire inside of their children. And I think it's there because they have to persevere mm -hmm. through more than you know, it, it, the word disability can be like a label, but it's really just, a, it's an obstacle. It's like, if you're not feeling well, if you're not, it's something that hinders your ability to move forward in life. Libby has the most resolve to push through hard things than I've ever seen. And her tenacity and her perseverance is unparalleled. Libby is, is loving and kind and tender but I want to tell you, if she doesn't want to do something, you will know about it and you will not control her. She's very, very in touch with the presence of God. Mm -hmm. She's very in touch with the atmosphere in a room. If people are sad, even if my husband and I, we're not fighting, we're just having a more like logistical conversation so that it's a little bit more maybe intense and fun. Mm -hmm. She will start going, no, 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 no. Like telling us, stop, stop. She'll tell us. And, um, and I'm like, oh, you are incredibly sensitive to tone, to nuance of, of voices and, and looks on faces. While she's very intense, very feisty, very fiery, she's also very connected to what's happening around it, incredibly caring. I'll tell you that most things that if whenever they do like assessments on her to tell me where she needs to grow, I think she's probably the fiercest about her growth over all of us. Like she will... Her, her preschool teacher was like she she won't take no for an answer like even from her own disability she will not take no from her disability she will push through that yeah, and figure so, out a way to get it done she's eager to learn she's eager to grow she's eager to continue so when you talk about um, the disability being you know the challenges how is it that you talk about it with your oldest with Aiden has he asked questions? What is that like in your family? So what's interesting is my husband's sister has Down syndrome. So okay. She's and she has Down syndrome. She's one of Aiden's best friends. Yes. Aiden, you know, for the longest time, didn't even know anything was different about Sarah. Um, but as he's got older, we could kind of tell he's starting to notice. And it was right around the same time Libby was starting to, we could start seeing like her development was delayed in certain areas. Yeah. Especially, you know, his friends that had siblings the same age were playing together, were interacting, and Libby's not talking. And yeah. she's not cognitively at that place where she can play the same way. And so uh, Liberty, when she's frustrated, can pinch sometimes or scratch. And that's because of her not being able to express herself. And so it takes a couple extra steps for our family 
to help Libby feel like she can engage with us the way that she needs. And it takes us sometimes initiating because she'll sometimes do it by negative behavior, but it's just to get our attention. And so we have talked to Aiden probably the last year and a half. So probably since he was about five mm -hmm. just saying, and Libby's about two, you know? So it's like, hey, so Libby has something called Down syndrome and Down, people with Down syndrome, you know, Sarah, Sarah also has that. And we, we started off with the positives they have got so much perseverance and they're really strong people. They've got really strong hearts. My son really cares about the heart. So I tried to not start with what she's not. I tried to start with what she is. I just want to say this as well, as we, you know, you talk about people with disabilities, a disability doesn't define someone. Their personhood is very established. And I don't believe that a disability is part of their personality. Mm -hmm. Just like I don't believe a sickness or an ailment is part of someone's personality or personhood, but it does influence yeah. someone. So yeah. if you had grief in your life, you are more empathetic to people with grief. And so Libby's disability has caused things in her character to emerge faster than maybe they would without. And so I think that's why we're seeing tenacity and perseverance. I think it's in her regardless of Down syndrome. There's an increased grace or highlight or spotlight on that area of her life because it's required and so anyway, we, we talked to Aiden about the positives, but then we say, so some of the things that happen though, when you have Down syndrome is that things happen differently. So yep. Libby's not talking yet. And I'll, we get the privilege of helping Libby learn to do that. And she's working really, really hard to do that. And so we're going to help her work really hard. We try and make Aiden feel part and feel like he gets to contribute to Libby's success without feeling the pressure to make Libby successful. Mm. I think that's very important is that it's not his job to be Libby's parent. Mm -hmm. uh, that's my job. Yeah. And, and it's not my job to be Libby's God. That's God's job. Yeah. My job is to be a mother and his job is to be a brother and older brother. And so we just, we talk about it and sometimes it comes up. Sometimes he tells people that Libby has Down syndrome. Sometimes we get into social circles where there's other kids and we'll say, Hey, Aiden, if you can just remember to include Libby and we also empower him to create boundaries. We tell, you know, if Libby's acting out in a way that's not fun or enjoyable. Aiden knows that he can tell other kids, Hey, you can tell Libby that's no fun because we want Libby to be able to interact with other children. That's important for us. The children feel empowered to feel powerful, to include her. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So have, have they come with questions to you? Aiden has definitely come to us with questions. There's been a couple of times where someone, uh, you know, kids are so honest. Mm -hmm. They're like, so why does she do that? I actually, like some parents get a bit nervous mm -hmm. of asking, like I can even tell with our friends, sometimes people don't want to say the wrong thing. Mm -hmm. I personally am not very intimidated by the wrong thing. I think the thing that affects us more is when people avoid it. Yeah. I'd rather them say it's wrong than say nothing at all. Yeah, I think for me, um, especially with our close friends. So, I mean, a kid once asked why she looks different. And I was like, oh yeah, she has. And obviously sometimes in my heart that creates sadness because I'm like, she doesn't deserve to have to go through that. Mm -hmm. But um, my job is to be her mom. And so in that moment, I, I don't get to feel, I get to, I get to shield her and I get to educate. And so I go, oh, she has Down syndrome and that makes her look a little different. But you know what also makes it makes her super funny. Yeah. And like, and I try, I try to lead people in how they can engage with her instead mm -hmm. of what they can't do. Yeah. Um, but we've had to be really real in our social circles. There are times where Libby behaviorally, she'll pinch another child because she's frustrated. And we have to talk to the, just say, hey guys, this is where our daughter's at. Yeah. How would you like us to manage her? Are you, you happy for us to talk to your children or do you like one of us to be with her? But I've noticed in every single one of our social circles that one, probably I'm more aware of Libby mm -hmm. and everyone else is. Everyone else is usually more chilled than I am. And okay. uh, that they're really happy to figure it out with us. Yeah. I think that parents just need to feel empowered and their children feel empowered to engage with her yeah. rather than feel like they can't do something because they don't want to get it wrong. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So it's creating that safe environment. Like, okay, if you say something, I won't be offended. I will actually step over and reach out and, and educate you or help you learn. And just real quick, we even had a situation with my best friend, her daughter, 
excluded Libby from something. I, I don't always know how to handle that sometimes, but my best friend stepped in because it's just her daughter. And she was just like, hey, that's not, that's not what we do here. Mm -hmm. and, and she took time with her daughter. And then afterwards, instead of feeling ashamed or distant from me, my friend messaged me and said, hey, I just feel really bad that that mm -hmm. happened. And I'm really sorry. I'm talking, we talked about it tonight together at bedtime about what it looks like to love liberty. Yeah. I just want to tell you that meant so much to me. And I don't mind, like for me, I'm like, I would, I know that with having real life engagement, there's going to be awkward times, but we ended up going for a long walk together and just talking about being moms and wanting the best for our children and the shame that can come with parents when our children act in a way that we wouldn't endorse, but you can't control your kids. No. <laughs> and so I think even in this, as people listen, I'm like, my encouragement is to not shy away mm -hmm. from those conversations because it's creating an environment where people who are different get to be included. And I want to tell you, people with Down syndrome are more the same than they are different. Mm -hmm. They are more, they have the same emotions, the same feelings. They feel rejection. They feel hurt. They feel happiness. They feel joy. They feel excitement. And we are, we are changing the narrative around people with disabilities. And we're no longer labeling them by their disability, but we're getting to know them by their personhood. My yeah. daughter, not down syndrome my daughter is liberty yeah yeah and she has a wonderful feasty personality and just and this last sunday when she just ran on stage and was dancing and just having the best time like that was so beautiful to see um like oh yeah there's there's kids that would be shy and just you know stay up the, to the side that's not her no <laughs> not, not at all if she no. could have the microphone she would have it Yes, exactly. So you mentioned that your uh, that your husband has a sister with Down syndrome. How has that helped or affected? You know, I think there were moments where it was hard for him having mm -hmm. a sister with Down syndrome. I think there's moments where um, there were challenges that came with that, that his sister wasn't the same as all his friends and all his friends knew it. But at the same time, um, his sister is amazing and she gives us a lot of hope for the moments where Libby is, um, yeah, may, maybe maybe acting out or because she's not verbal, she's she's do, doing things that are, that are frustrating or create anxiety. Like, you know, when she pinches her baby brother and it's like, it feels like sometimes we have to be on guard a lot. I just, it gives me hope because he can tell me, oh, Sarah was like that mm. when, and I look at Sarah now and Sarah is a 35 year old adult who is integrated into society. She communicates very well. She is very kind. She's highly responsible. She's very able. So I think for me, I'm like, it gives me a lot of hope. Um, at the same time, I think Ryan had to navigate, like there was moments where he maybe didn't feel like the greatest brother to Sarah because yep. siblings are siblings, right? Yeah. And and he has had to navigate like, oh, but I'm, I'm not brother Ryan anymore. I'm dad. And dad is, and I get to now talk to my son about things that I needed to know about mm. that because I've actually had experience. His, Ryan's parents were amazing with Sarah and amazing with Ryan, but his parents, your children don't talk to you about everything. It's just, you know, children, it's hard for me to get my son to tell me how his day was at school sometimes. Mm -hmm. It was fun, mom. Um, <laughs> And I think that's been really helpful because instead of, instead of going, oh, it's the same, we get to go, oh, we get to now take what we know yep. and help educate our son and equip him. Um, and it equips us as parents to go, okay, this is what Aiden's probably going to need right now. Or the moments where we're like, he needs something, Ryan can go, I remember feeling this. Mm. Aiden, oh, I remember feeling like this. And it gives Aiden permission Yep. to communicate and express and that keeps like resentment or any like I mean and normal sibling relationships have that mm -hmm. and it kind of just keeps the pathway open it keeps it from like being blocked off yeah that makes sense yeah yeah and it, it gives an extra level of understanding of what uh, Aiden is going through for your dreams and hopes for the future you already mentioned like Sarah being very helpful in actually having a hopeful more hopeful narrative what is your hope? My goodness. I have 
really realistic, doable dreams. And then I have some really big ones that I'm going to need God for. Uh huh. Um, oh, it gets me a little bit emotional. Um, I just want to say this, like, I'm not scared of Libby's future. I'm really confident in Libby. Um, I don't cry because I'm sad. I think that's something as parents, sometimes I get nervous of is that when you cry or share challenges that people would think that my child is challenging. My daughter is not challenging. Mm -hmm. She has a disability and a disability creates challenge. Yeah. Challenge for her and challenge for us. But liberty is not challenging. Yeah. Um, it's just like if your child was sick, a cold can be challenging, but a cold is not my child. And I think sometimes parents who have children with disabilities, they get nervous about talking about the challenge mm -hmm. because people think they're talking about their child. Mm. And my child is a delight and a gift. And she teaches me and she challenges me in things that I need to be challenged in. And um, so when I dream for Libby, I kind of have, I mean, I dream of seeing a center in Reading where we are that is equipped to, that's beautiful. And it's equipped to give them skills and make space for people with disabilities where they're not tolerated, but they're championed. They're celebrated and they're known. Um, I dream, I dream of her having dreams. If she wants to get married, I dream of a spouse for her. If she wants to be single and travel the world, I dream of that for her. I dream of her being able to do whatever she wants to put her mind to. And if she wants to stay home for the rest of her life, I want her home. Like, and if she wants to move into an apartment, I want her to do that. Like I, I don't need Libby to go and I don't need Libby to stay. Yeah. I want Libby to be all that she was created to be and Libby, her name is Liberty. She is a liberator. She's a box breaker. She's a glass ceiling annihilator. And um, she is going to show the world yeah. what is possible. Um, I do dream of seeing the things that people say impossible become possible for her. I, in my heart of hearts, I'd love to see her married and have a fulfilled relationship. But I don't need that to happen to be a happy mom. Mm -hmm. So I think one thing that I realized really quickly is I don't need anything from Libby. I, as a mother, I don't need anything from her. I like, I don't need anything to change. She can stay. My love for her is whole and complete. Yeah. There's nothing she could do to make me love her more. There's mm -hmm. nothing she could do to make me love her less. Yeah. Um, but for her sake, I dream. Yeah. For her sake, I fight. For her sake, I push. And anytime I'm pushing for my sake, I need to back up. That's when anxiety shows up. When I'm trying to do it for, because I'm afraid and I'm trying to make fear go away. And that's for all my kids, you know, like I have a rule in my house. I don't discipline for my sake. So if I'm disciplining to make me look like a good parent, if I'm dis like, you know, my parents come into town from South Africa and my kid acts out and in my house, when I was a kid, that would have been dealt with this way. Mm. Our house, maybe we don't. And sometimes I can feel that pressure of appearing to my mom and dad in a way that would please them. And in those yeah. moments, I will not discipline because I won't discipline to make me look good. Mm. Discipline is for the benefit of our children. Um, dreams is for the benefit of our children. So um, I dream of Libby being a singer. Mm -hmm. I dream of Libby uh, preaching on yeah. stage on microphone yeah. yeah i love her having beautiful relationships and connections that are meaningful and bring her joy i dream of her uh, having opinions that are listened to and valuable i dream of her um being in an environment where she is celebrated and championed but also developed that people aren't afraid because she has a disability to grow her um i don't i don't want her to stay in a place that she's capable of, of growing out of. Mm -hmm. and so um, I, I expect of Liberty great things. Yeah. Uh, not, not because I believe for it on own, because I, I know a big God. Mm -hmm. I 
I know two parents that are, are fully believing in that God and in who God called her to be. Yeah. And so, um, yeah, I, I think I dream of a community that will champion her. Mm -hmm. and yeah. And, and I remember you at some point mentioning something when we were in school and um, I was listening to you while you were on stage and you said something um, about how you how there is part of you that is concerned about the future, most not because of what Libby would be capable of, but actually how maybe the society around her would respond to her is that still would you say like from all the concerns that there are like if you have any concerns at all you know i think there'll be moments where society in ignorance usually it's usually yeah. intentional it's usually just ignorance and i've i've decided to have a high tolerance for ignorance i've chosen in my life that i will not be offended by ignorance but i will i will become a gentle and loving voice to help educate around ignorance um but what i will say is libby did started preschool this year she's in a state preschool um it's not at our you know aiden's in our christian school libby was put in a state preschool because there's there's facilities for her there's yeah. uh, speech therapy there that she needs and um it's an all-inclusive environment but she was probably there was two children on education plans she was probably the most severely disabled if i have mm -hmm. to say although yeah. on the spectrum she's very high functioning at three and a half she's not talking a lot that's growing now mm -hmm. but watching for the last six months watching how these teachers who aren't faithful faith-based teachers mm -hmm. and children have facilitated um education and community around my daughter has given me such incredible hope for the future of people with disabilities things like having parent teacher conference and i know having someone with a disability like they're having to give her extra attention they're having to teach the children she's not talking so what they taught they taught the children sign for libby they yeah. taught signs that libby knows they taught them words that libby uses yeah. and having a teacher tell me that having liberty in the class is good for everybody that we see it as a privilege to have liberty in our class because we get to learn yep. more about people with disabilities and it teaches us to be people who, who are loving and communicative and full of empathy. Libby makes us stronger. Libby pushes us. Libby teaches us that the things that we can't do, if we just keep trying, we can do it. To hear that come from a, a mainstream typical kind of environment like the recognition that Libby's not a burden that she's a gift yeah that is a change in mentality I want to tell you I did not grow up with that thought process yeah. people take their kids from people with disabilities and now we're saying she's a gift and they're absolutely right yeah Libby, yeah so I've, I've heard that so many times like where you actually see and even in one of the uh, past episodes where one of the teachers like the classes that were inclusive it was it's not only because of the right for the student that has a right to be educated or the but it's actually a right for everyone to be um and it's and it's beneficial for everyone because we all become kinder human beings actually being exposed and having an opportunity to to maybe go a little slower if that's the pace that someone can go or to do it a little different or to learn sign language and be actually more more open to to those changes and those different ways of doing it i mean in society right now we are championing efficiency effectiveness influence all these things i don't actually know if that develops the human soul mm -hmm. i don't know if we're built to just be machines that produce and people with disabilities they remind you like laugh sometimes go mm -hmm. a little slower yeah. like like speak your mind mm -hmm. if you don't want to don't do it just Libby goes no stop no. just tell me no stop sometimes I want to sing with her and she goes stop and she'll tell me and I'm like oh you want to sing by yourself you know what sometimes I also don't want to be interrupted and it's like that thing of like we've learned to adjust ourselves mm. to be most effective and most influential but the things that make me come alive are eating Ben and Jerry's on the couch laughing with my kids and I'm like oh I think when we bring people that are different, it reminds us that what makes us come alive is humanity. 
is not our accolades or our trophies, but it's how our heart comes alive in our day-to-day life. Are we laughing? Are we learning? Are we growing? Are we humble? Are we loving? And um, I think that while I don't believe that God gives people disabilities, I do not personally believe that. Mm -hmm. I do know that God will use those things yeah the good of ev- of that person and everyone around them you know romans 8 28 says that he makes all things work for the good of those who love him and so i believe that the things that we learn is that is because of the grace of god allowing us to enter into his heart in a circumstance that he didn't ordain but he will use for libby's good and for our good and everyone around her yeah there's a lot of healing that can happen or is it actually like there's a big invitation like will I be able to do I step into the invitation to um to learn and to grow and to see oh this is something that I don't know how to do this for you how do I help you I know how to help other children but how do I help you to become the best version of you or on a little bit of another note I know that you are big on friendships and healthy communication and talking you know talking well like you said how Libby is you know she will say what she thinks to actually communicate those things and not just always adapt to what we think is more expected of us. How has your conversation, like how have your conversations with your friends been to talk about this? And, and you also mentioned sometimes when people don't mention it or don't talk about it, that's, that's the most painful or the hardest. Um, How has that been? For a while I noticed I was avoiding birthday parties. Um, I'm a pastor. I'm very busy with people all day and I'm tired on the weekend. Yeah. And birthday parties were some of the most challenging things for us because most of the kids get along and then my daughter's different so as parents people want to talk to us and connect with us because their kids are happily playing yeah mine needs supervision because mine is learning and she will get to the point where she won't need supervision but it's going to take a couple more years without a miracle right and so I started noticing, oh, I don't want to go on Saturday mornings because I'm tired and I don't have the energy to have to try and maintain beautiful adult conversation and manage my kid and make sure. And then I also feel responsible for Libby to have a good time. And so, and I'm highly responsible. Some of that's just how I'm wired. Mm -hmm. And I just have to start telling my friends, like guys, birthday parties are stressful for me and I want to come celebrate your kid, but I feel bad that we start 17 different conversations and we don't finish them. I want to engage with you. I just have this going on or sometimes we have to leave early because she's overstimulated and I just, I'm just tired. Or sometimes I'm going to need your help and I don't want you to be afraid of telling your children, like we use the word, that's no fun. I'm like, if you could help, like, and my friends have been like, absolutely. And I think actually what it does is it creates empathy. Yeah. honestly it, it's scary to be vulnerable like that but all it's created is understanding mm-hmm. and empathy. so I'm not leaving your birthday party because I'm upset I'm leaving it because I'm done and I'm tired and I love you and they know and they're like and so now all of a sudden they have empathy or when I have those conversations all of a sudden some of the bigger kids now the parents are saying hey could you keep an eye on Libby and make sure this this and all of a sudden it's like oh I'm not having to do all of it my community is starting to carry some of the weight for me when Libby pinched a friend and those parents because I talked to them they're like oh yeah Libby does that when she's frustrated you just get to say hey that's no fun what do you need and I think it's been really important that we talk and I don't love it I'd prefer to pretend everything's awesome and we've got it all under control but we don't and we need our community and we're better with our community yeah. And so I've just had lots of those like really vulnerable conversations. And you know what you quickly find out though? Yeah, there's some there can be some grief sometimes where you realize some people just don't want to engage there. Um, but then you find out the ones that do want to. Yeah. And those are usually going to be the ones that are going to be lifelong connections. And I just want to say this too. If there's anyone listening and you have a child, a small child with Down syndrome, I was nervous to send Libby to school. I didn't know how that was going to go. She has a little best friend. And I tell you what, that friend is more interested in Libby than Libby is interested in her. I went to Libby's graduation. This little girl, she's like, where's Libby? I can't go to the playground because Libby's not here. Like, and she's obsessed with Libby. And here I am wondering if my child's going to have friends. 
Mm-hmm. And instead of Libby having to pursue friendship, she has a friend pursuing her. Yeah. And uh, I just wanted to speak to that, like, be honest in your friendships. Don't speak when you're offended. Try speak before. Try communicate before there's a big problem. Yeah. Uh, people don't know what it's like and they're scared to assume because they don't want to offend you. And so I've just had to learn to gently and lovingly communicate where we're at. It draws our community in and invites them into being being owners of Libby's development. What you're saying is like, oh, I feel a little, I, I might have to say something about it, but it's actually, it costs, it costs me something to say that to my friends or to actually be open about it. But what you're saying is you have felt that cost, you've counted it and you've actually gone after it and it has brought you something. It has brought you closer community. Yeah, short term, it's uncomfortable. Yeah. Long term, it's very beneficial. Everything in life, if you're going to get a long-term benefit, there might be some short-term pain. You go to the gym for the first time, there's going to be some short-term pain. Mm-hmm. Well, you keep going to the gym and after a couple of weeks of very sore muscles and having to like move through things that just feel like so much effort, all of a sudden you start building something you haven't built before. That's every area of life. That's definitely something we've had to do, um, but it is producing really good fruit for us. Yeah. And beautiful friendship. It actually ties in where we started, the res- the resilience that Libby carries to actually push through the challenges, push through some of those. Like if we, um, as adults, also, if we face something, we can actually push through and we can choose to push through. And that's a wonderful lesson that she teaches us already with her young age, three and a half, that she's teaching us, hey, you can actually do this. You know, don't just give up because it's hard. Find a way to do it and find a way to, to go into it. Thanks. That's really good. So what questions would you say, you know, if there's people watching that want to be a friend to someone who has a disability, how would you say how to start those conversations? What can people start, uh, start with? Well, firstly, everyone that has a disability or is around someone with a disability is not unaware that that person has a disability or that they have one. So I'm like, for starters, I think a lot of people don't want to talk about it. This I, I lead an online ministry school. We had a young man on there who is um, in a wheelchair. He's got a trach. He, um, uh, he's got some kind of a cerebral palsy with um, his body just is not functioning the way that it was designed to. And he wasn't able to come to our in-person school. Sometimes people want to avoid because mm-hmm. they don't want to say the wrong thing. I'm like, That young man is fully aware of what's going on in his life. Avoiding him or ignoring him does not make him feel more powerful or more included. Um, Even calling on him, and if he's not able, like, so for instance, his pastor just chose to call on him to share stuff. And even if he, you know, because he's got a trach, he can't share as extensively. But does that mean he doesn't share at all? No. Mm -hmm. And I think one thing that's important is if you're wanting to start engaging with someone that has a disability, firstly, remember that their disability isn't the primary thing about them. So they, so all the things that, that make you feel happy, they also have things that make them feel happy. The things that make you feel sad, they also have things that make you feel sad. They are more the same than they are different from you. And so treat them like that. The second thing is, if there's things you're unsure about what it's like for them, ask them. Ask them as parents. Instead of assuming, uh, there's some people with beautiful hearts, Mm -hmm. they assume what it's like. And it's very hard to talk about it then because it's like, oh, it must be so scary that she's going to be with you for the rest of your life. I don't know how to respond to that because it's not scary. Maybe ask me hey will Libby stay with you for for or or do you think she will go to college like what do you like what are your thoughts about after school ask me because I'll tell you one I don't mind if she stays with me for the rest of my life Mm -hmm. like that's not scary for me that's exciting all of you you're going to say goodbye to your kids mine might stay and I'm going to have a party because I get to be close to you know like that like I can be funny about it but at the same time there's a lot of opportunities for people with disabilities there's universities that they can go to there's programs that they can be involved in and so I would encourage you to not 
avoid the yep. questions you don't know the answer to and don't just ask say hey like I've had people liken down syndrome to autism and I'm like that's just ignorance down syndrome and autism are very different things yep. if you don't know the difference ask hey I maybe I should know this but I don't what is the difference between down syndrome and autism what does Libby have oh Libby has down syndrome and I'll tell you about it happily yeah um and so I think that's very important is that one, don't, don't, inter don't meet the disability first, meet the person. And then two, like the things you don't know, we, we are very much, I live with someone with Down syndrome every day. I'm not trying to pretend Libby doesn't have Down syndrome. So you asking me a question about it is not going to make me sad or uncomfortable. It is my life. So you can ask anything you want and I will happily tell you because it tells me you're interested in my family. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think that's um, over all the conversations that I've had. It's it's the maybe we feel awkward having a conversation or bringing something up or talking about it, but actually the best way is just naming it what it is, or be like, hey, how do I? How should I pronounce? How should I say this? What is the best best words? Or maybe I say something wrong, but please tell me. I'm just really interested yeah, not shy away from it because we are interested and a lot of people have questions and it's okay to ask them and it's okay to, to actually express the interest that we, that we have. Thank you so much for this conversation. I think we could continue this conversation for a long, long time, but I also know that you have some other meetings to go to. So thank you for this time vocalizing for us what it is like to, to live life this way, but also to just say, hey, ask questions that's okay we would love to share with you or at least you would love to share and probably other parents also like to share the stories and the individuals that have the disabilities that overcome challenges we can view them in a different lens and in a different way we can actually see them as overcomers we can see them as so much more than than someone with a disability or with a certain diagnosis so thank you so much thanks so much for having me it was honestly such a privilege. I know I'm very excited and quite intense sometimes, but it's just because I'm so passionate about this. And my real hope is that whoever is listening, that it either gives them some insight into some questions they have or gives hope. My prayer is that it gives hope to parents uh, who are navigating uncertainties, just knowing like it actually turns out pretty fantastic. It's going to like short-term pain is going to produce a lot of long-term gain. And so if anyone just is listening and I just feel this, like if anyone's listening and you're in a time where you're like, man, I, I'm scared of the future. I don't know what's coming or I'm having a hard time interacting with friends because of, you know, what's going on with my kid. And I just want to encourage you, this will pass. It will not be forever. Let your heart be known. Let people come around you. You don't have to do it by yourself. Ask for help. And you might ask five times and not get it every time. But I tell you, one, one day of help for me can bring enough reprieve for me to kind of refocus and be like, this is what we're doing. So I just, if there's anyone, I just, yeah, I just bless you with grace and peace, knowing that this will pass and that your little one is going to be unbelievable and is going to bring so much value to the world. It might not be the most influential or it might be, but value doesn't come from how well we are known. Value comes from how we affect one person's life. So, yeah, I just want to say that. Thank you so much for um, being here today, Haley. <laughs>